when you have to do something as large as climate change, the scale of the transformation terrifies people. People from West Virginia say, I saw what happened to Cleveland and Detroit. Why should I join this romance when you guys are going to leave us behind and crush us? In other words, the resistance to the obvious dangers of climate come from the people who don't trust the system to create transformational energy so that we're all better off. Rob Johnson has been a player among the elites, but he's also a plain-spoken, passionate critic of an economic, financial, and political system that leaves too many behind. He previously served as chief economist of the U.S. Senate Banking Committee, was an executive producer of the Oscar-winning documentary Taxi to the Dark Side, was a management director at Soros Fund Management, and is now the president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking and host of the podcast Economics and Beyond. Welcome, Rob Johnson, again to Free Forum, a world that just might work. Well, Terrence, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and uh, I was delighted to look through your crystal ball from November of 2020 and see how much foresight you brought to the table. I'm looking forward to more of it today. Yeah. Um, you know, I like listeners to get a feel for the people. I, I say we don't, we don't interview books or projects. We talk to people. So people behind the ideas and the work, and I'm going to throw you a curve. I know there's a segment of your life and career that doesn't show up in the bio um, very often, and that's your time in the music business. Mm, I want mm. you to just tell me a little bit about your time in the music business, what you did, and what you learned that stays with you in the work you do today. Okay. Well, that's, that's a fascinating challenge. I'll start with, in growing up in Detroit, I have a father. His name was Arthur Johnson who was a jazz pianist and a physician. He had various patients, famous Motown uh, artists and so forth. Uh, he was very involved in the jazz scene. My mother was a choral singer with for holidays and so forth with the Detroit Symphony and became their development director. So if you said to me, what did I learn? When I came home from sports practice, I'd take a shower. And I'd sit at the top of the steps Dad's on the piano, Mom's in the kitchen, she's singing along. I could tell, can I ask for an increase in my allowance, the car keys, report a bad test or report card? I could feel from the music where we were, and the music was more truthful than words. Mm -hmm. And so that, what you might call spirit compass, was a very, very big part of my childhood, and... I got very involved in the music scene. Obviously, Motown music was there in Detroit, but even the British invasion in rock, I'm talking about late 60s, early 70s, uh, you know, and you would hearken back to the blues. So a little bit later in my life, when I left the financial industry, I set up a blues label. And, and the uh, I was very fortunate to meet and work with a man named Jim O'Neill, who founded Living Blues Magazine. He had founded Rooster Blues, and I could work with him. I bought some masters from him, and then we worked on a whole variety of things. Uh, some new artists at the time, uh, Willie King, who won all kinds of W.C. Handy Awards for Best New Artists, and his song Terrorized was written as he watched 9-11, but it was a song about how his people had been terrorized and we didn't have the sympathetic reaction mm. that you were seeing for the people that were victimized in the buildings. And there were all kinds of dilemmas in that. Uh, I worked with a genius artist who was a very controversial creature, Ike Turner, in his comeback. And uh, he made a record which we called Here and Now, and then he made a subsequent record, Some of the Masters Came From Us, where he won a Grammy just in 2007 for Best Traditional Blues Record. It was on another label, because I had closed my label by the time, but what I, what I learned about that was redemption. This is a guy, I'm not apologizing for what he did or denying anything, but I watched him take the gifts that God gave him, what he could impart, put himself together and get back out there. So he went through some tough times and 
for some reason, God willing, he won a Grammy in the last year of his life. So uh, that, I've been involved with a wonderful project in 2018, the film Amazing Grace. Aretha Franklin made it in 1972, but came back to life, reconnected with Detroit, saw her just before, a few months before she passed away, when she thought her cancer was in remission. And what I can say to you to summarize all of this is, my father was an atheist, my mother was a devout Scottish Presbyterian. I don't know where I sit on the father and the son, but when it comes to the Holy Ghost, you got Jimi Hendrix guitar, you got Aretha's voice, you got Bob Dylan's lyrics, you got Marvin Gaye's social conscious, you got John Coltrane's horn, there are more, but <laughs> I think there is a Holy Ghost. I think there is a spiritual dimension that rides right along with this guy who got trained as an economist and worked in which you might call the mechanics of government and finance. And so it, it, it changed my lens in ways that are very powerful. So let me ask you um, any response to my introduction. You already said, you know, that you, you, you think it's a good starting point, but any, any yes. more specifics? I think what you perceived was that an election, there might be a lesser of two evils, but there was a systemic structure that was largely broken and there are enormous challenges on the horizon, albeit the pandemic was emerging then, but it's been more persistent than either you have or I might have expected. Climate change has reared its head. And what I would say is it had reared its head long before. Uh, my friend David Fenton and all kinds of other people, Naomi Klein, others have been telling us. But what happened was with the turmoil, and I'll add January 6th to that, though that's not in your night, but with the turmoil in the politics, with the disservice to large portions of the country during globalization, automation, machine learning, and so forth, the stresses were accumulating. And once you become afraid, you become more sensitive to that which makes you more afraid. So the awareness of climate change is heightened. The, per, the prescient ones that I mentioned were already there. The merchants of doubt were working the media channels for the fossil fuel industry. But everybody now, I think, is on deck and alert. The, the pandemic, in some ways, was an unmasking of all the structural flaws that we see. And as, as, as uh, I said, uh, and we said, that it does create an opportunity and the question is how, how who attempts to take advantage of that opportunity and are we able to reach deeper than usual because mm -hmm. of the break to uh, as we reimagine how we come out of this do we make enough of a difference to make a difference yeah let me let me take us back a little bit yeah uh, what I perceive is that there was a time when people on the left believed in government. I'll talk about the New Deal, FDR era through Lyndon Johnson, so faith in the Kennedy administration early on. And there were people who disagreed with that, were largely in the Republican Party, and they believed in the market. So you had uh, what you might call a romantic faith in government on the left and a romantic faith in markets on the right. What's happened in recent years as the role, I'll start with approximately the Carter administration, as the role of money in politics has become enormous. And my research director, Tom Ferguson, Benjamin Page, Martin Gill, and see, a lot of these scholars have really codified this. The role of money in politics led to something. There's a gentleman, a former musical artist named Stuart Zeckman, who gave a prescient podcast in 2010 where he said, an unnamed Obama official said, we can't go back to be like the No Deal. People don't believe in that anymore. 
And he dug into the Gallup polls that this anonymous Obama official put on an interview, I think, on Politico or something. And in the Gallup polls, what did he find? He found that the people on the left didn't trust the government because they thought it was captured. That the role of money in politics had overridden the legitimacy of governance. And that has really scrambled our deck, bringing it closer to the surface now. Or, or the present, not the surface. Uh, let me, now let me you have a left. If I, yeah. if I may, I don't want to lose, don't sure. lose your train of thought, but two thoughts sure. that have come to me so far. One is that one of the things that uh, we were told was that president elections, that, that the, the influence of television in presidential elections happened in 1960 when the debate between Kennedy and Nixon were Nixon, televised. Yeah. Yeah. I think the real revolution of television happened a bit later when television advertising became the key component of campaigns right because that skyrocketed the money and you had republicans whose mm -hmm. uh platforms when they used to have them were aligned with their funders so yes. republicans could go for touchdowns they were doing their funders bidding exactly. democrats Funders became the same. Clinton was the strongest one to go in that direction. Although, as you say, once the price of, of campaigns changed, all Democrats began leaning in that direction. Sure. And yet they espouse principles. And this is very much that, that thing that, that, that we both have, have, have noticed and we'll talk about more. They, they espouse principles that weren't necessarily their funders, but were more the people. But... If, you, if you're split that way, you don't go for touchdowns. Mm -hmm. You no, satisfy right. yourself with getting to the 20-yard line and kicking a field goal, and <laughs> you end up losing. Go ahead. Yes, yes, I think you're right on target. I'll, I'll cite my friend Tom Ferguson again, his book with Joel Rogers, Right Turn, the form of the Democratic Leadership Council, the move which Clinton eventually became... Uh, which you might call the candidate of their yeah. choice. And and people can lament, which you might call the immoral nature of that, but you're talking about something that's true. The structural change meant if you're going to thrive, you have to raise money. Now you've got to find donors. And that transformed the, the very nature of politics. So when you come forward, a person like Barack Obama, there was a certain magic about him when he was a candidate in 2007 and 8. I had a son who was in college at the time at Pomona College in California, and he said, Dad, your generation makes sure that Obama's going to win. I said, why is that? He said, because you guys all talk romantically about the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. He's anti-Iraq war. He sounds like a preacher. This guy's going to get elected. The young people are really going to flock to it, and so will your generation. We did. But then the money concentration of Wall Street and the bailouts, as David Sirota has recently articulated beautifully in his podcast that he made with my old friend Alex Gibney called Meltdown, which you can get on Audible for free. That changed us into an environment where, as you're saying, you're trying to kick a field goal, but you got the Tea Party on one side and Occupy Wall Street spawned on the other. Nobody's happy with field goals. And then it continues on, Republican control of the House, role of the Senate, Donald Trump elected. I was in Detroit the night before the election, in 2016, preparing for a conference that we were doing on the Friday after the election. And I, w I talked to a man who used to work in a building as a security officer where my father worked. And I asked him, what do you think is going to happen in the election? He said, Mr. Johnson, when there is nothing on the menu anybody wants to order, they don't go out to dinner. There's not going to be turnout. And I said, well, you've got Trump and this. And he said, well, Trump's telling everybody the system is rigged and the big three have lost all the jobs. Very few people have talked that kind of truth. I said, okay, why'd you come out for him? Well, I'm scared of him. 
What about on the Clinton side? Well, they did NAFTA. They did criminal justice reform. They did welfare reform. That's not going to sell in Michigan. And as you know, Donald Trump won, I think, by 13,000 votes in the why state. Did, why didn't the bailout of the auto companies uh, play bigger in that in that vote? I've always wondered that, and yeah, you yeah. may know. <laughs> I don't know, but I heard from people who stayed there. I have a lot of friends who, like, gone to law school, gone to MBAs and stuff that work in the in the southeastern Michigan. And what they said was that the bailout of the auto industry took care of the white-collar workers but allowed some of the money to be used to build new plants in China and Mexico. Now, I don't, I, I'm not, I don't have a zoom lens on that, but that is what I kept hearing over and over and over. When Trump got nominated in Cleveland, he came to Detroit, to the Economic Club of Detroit, and he took on top management. He didn't pander to donors in that theatrical episode. Obviously, you might say in the subsequent years, because that structural system we're talking about is there, he seduced and abandoned the people that he got to support him with his tax cuts and support for the fossil fuel industry and what have you. And how would I say, it felt to a lot of people like Obama had gone to Wall Street and Trump had gone to plutocracy, both engendered a hope Neither delivered on the hope. Right, right. Well, yeah, the way I, I had thought about it last night was Obama didn't try, and Trump did bait and switch. Right. Hell, that's and, right. And now, but then, and, and, and if we can, let's deal just a little bit with the Biden administration, because my third thing is the Biden platform did seem to speak to some of the pain of both, mm -hmm. uh, not just people yes. of color, but also... Yes white working class, the white, the working class and the middle class, exactly. if um, if there, you could snap your fingers and the Biden platform were enacted, they would benefit. Um, however, uh, for, from my perspective, and then I'll, I'll toss it to you, the precariousness of the Senate majority, if you will, 50-50 mm -hmm. with the vice president, is a result of the past two decades, yes. of everything we've been yes. talking about, of the Democrats not delivering for those people. So now when you come 20 years later and you say, now I'm gonna deliver for you, you haven't got the backing that allows you to do it. And now that feeling that government is rigged and incompetent or insufficient is now reinforced and i feel that's the mm -hmm. moment we're kind of in now your thoughts on where right. we stand a year after where we started i think that's right i mean my own intuition at the time was that someone like bernie sanders or elizabeth warren put a progressive platform out there but nobody trusted that they could navigate the rapids of this system biden gave the feel of an awareness and caring, particularly for what you might call white middle class, what they used to call Reagan Democrats. So people thought he may be the guy that can take the Reagan Democrats back from Trump and win. But once he won, he inherited the system that you talked about and what you might call the stalemates, build back better, can't change the filibuster, all the kind of things that are taking place. Uh, it, it's demoralizing the public. This current debate about whether congressional officials working on policy ought to be able to buy stocks in the realm where they are the architects of what will be the rules of the game or the enforcement is also, it's extremely demoralizing. It, and it also makes you feel almost like the politicians are tone deaf yeah. about what angst is out there. Yeah. And, and, and what, what kills me, Rob, is that the people that, that like Pelosi, let's say, you know, just and, and others, the people in power in the Democratic Party, they've made enough damn money. They're old. They've made plenty. To right now come out for that yeah. policy full force would be such a smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. 
No, it's it's a res, res, restoration of ethical balance. Is on how would I say it's it's what the doctor ordered. In part, it's not sufficient, but it's a dimension of it, and it, it's symbolic of a healthier sense of governance. And I, the other thing that I find very very painful, mm. and, you know, coming from Detroit, creates some of the echoes here. I always tell people. I grew up in the city that America divorced when it needed help. But uh, when I see evidence that INET has fostered in some of his research about let's call the geography of up and down in the economy, in the localities where there's a downturn, obviously surveys of anxiety about health and future uh, economic prosperity, concerned about for your children, rises up in the surveys. When you look at the geographic map in the United States, and I'll go beyond that in a moment, but when you look at that geographic map, what you see is the places where people are anxious about employment security are also the places where racial animosity explodes. People blame others when they're scared. And the destruction. My friend and scholar Peter Timmon wrote a book about the decline of the middle class. And what he essentially said is, because of automation and other things, we transform to a service-based economy. With a service-based economy, there are two kinds of services. Low-margin services, what they call like flipping hamburgers or whatever, and high-margin services that require an education. So in the old days, people like the great Nobel laureate W. Arthur Lewis talked about the migration from the farm to the cities and the plants. The Wizard of Oz is a parable of that whole thing. But you were moving to high productivity. Today, the movement from low to high productivity services is through the education system. But when you had all this racial animosity, all of the turmoil impeded the formulation of a national education platform, what we call public schools, so that everybody could have a chance to go up that escalator. And this was very interesting to Dr. Peter Temin, because as he said in some panels and wrote that what INET was working on, he said, this is, this is really a problem because about 70% of the population is going to be in these low margin services. And these white people are destroying their own ladder because they're distracted in a way that you and I have talked about. Nancy Frazier in a wonderful illuminating pamphlet talked about the substitution of identity politics for focus on economic structure of which the education system is a part. Yeah, let, let's let's jump to Nancy Fraser. Uh, uh, you know, there's no telling what we'll end up missing and what we'll end up covering in this hour. But uh, I, I, you recommended uh, Nancy Fraser's. Um, uh, you call it a pamphlet because it's a 63-page book. Um, mm -hmm. It's called The Old is Dying and the New Cannot Be Born, and I in turn recommend it to listeners and viewers because I feel she clarifies and names some aspects of our political and economic situation which I'd been talking about sort of in rougher terms. And, and she very specifically coins the term progressive neoliberalism, mm -hmm. and that's that, that's what came with Clinton and Blair in the UK and so on and mm -hmm. and Gore and the Democratic Leadership Council and what you did was going back to what we said before your your funders are now Wall Street and and big corporations and wealthy individuals and Silicon but, Valley and Silicon Valley exactly Hollywood oh, well in Hollywood yeah, exactly yeah. and yet you you speak, as you said, identity politics, um, f uh, women, uh, gender issues, and race, and so on. But it means that you can make progress socially, you can make progress culturally, 
but you won't really change the money issues. And, and at the same time, you're not changing the money issues for the white uh, lower uh, uh, working in lower middle class. And they right. see that you are making gains for the other. And that goes back to uh, Arlie Hoke's chilled strangers in their own exactly. land in exactly. which she has that wonderful image of the deep story that she discovered in southern Louisiana, yep. which is that I'm in line for the American dream. I'm not getting anywhere. And you, Obama, Democrats, etc., are helping other people break in front of me. Mm -hmm. And and so you it's. It's such a, well, on the one hand, I look at it, you look at it, and we say this is such a losing strategy, and yet it completely took over the, uh, the Democratic leadership for two decades. Yeah. There's also a book uh, that I thought illuminated this very well, Sarah Kenzior, uh book, uh, I think it was called The View from Flyover America, where the coastal regions were prospering and the the Midwest, the core, the Mid-South were migrating towards Donald Trump out of despair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I suppose you take it one step further and you go to, you know, the folks who wrote about the uh, deaths of despair. Yes. The ones who yes. didn't just vote yeah. for Trump but oh, died no. of obesity and yeah. opioid addiction and alcoholism. Yeah from the same yeah. disappointment, desperation, and just a feeling that you no longer matter, you no longer belong. Mm -hmm. And the People, media has been no help at all yeah. in this. No, <laughs> but let's talk Angus just a little. Deaton, some Angus Deaton, Ann Case. That's uh, right. A woman named Shannon Monat, who was at Syracuse for a time. And they, they, by the way, I said I'd take this a little bit internationally. When I look at these geographic studies of despair, where economies suffer largely because of machine learning, automation, globalization, or austere state and local budgets, you see things happen like Brexit in the UK, Marie Le Pen in France, the AFD party in Germany, or a comparison of how Donald Trump did against Hillary Clinton versus the last time that two challengers were running against each other, and that was when George W. Bush was running against Al Gore. And the places where Trump's delta was biggest were the same places that were suffering from the diseases of despair. Sure. And, there, and, and, the, and the analog in the other countries fits like a glove, too. And, and the thing is, you, despair can lead to suicide, it can lead to self-destruction, but if you think that the only time you get to express your despair is in an election, it leads to anger. Yes. Right? You don't take yes. it out on yourself on that one election day that comes up every two to four years. You take it out mm -hmm. and, and, and you vote for Trump. Um, when Nancy Fraser uh, analyzes, she says, what we've been saddled with on the uh, on the Democratic side is progressive neoliberalism and neoliberalism mm -hmm. I, I'll let you give us a, a quick definition and then let me return to to what I'm saying so you're the economist among us well I guess when when people talk about neoliberalism it's joining the market romance it's not like we're looking at the ends that people experience. We're looking at the means, which is the use of the market, the illusions that it creates freedom, where those in poverty are not entirely responsible. There, there's a notion they call economic justice. Economic justice says in the literature you have a certain level of productivity for which you are responsible to cultivate through education, disciplines, good nutrition, what are all the elements of it. And you get paid what economists call your marginal product. And that's economic justice. If you get paid more than your marginal product, that's called a subsidy. 
if you get paid less than your marginal product, that's called exploitation. Now, there's a problem. Your marginal product is grown in the context of social institutions for which we are all collectively responsible. And so it's not as if you can blame the victim when certain regions of the country get devastated while the wealthiest winners who used to be accused of tax evasion have lobbied and now keep their money offshore and we call it tax avoidance and then we say we can't afford it in the United States. So the collective systemic design has an awful lot to do with whether your position of productivity and economic justice allows you to support a family, your health, your life, etc. In other words, the illusion that neoliberalism fosters or, right. or contributes and to and is that on. the market is providing that vitality and efficiency and that there is no collective responsibility. And that's a convenient ideology for a progressive Democrat who needs to go raise money in order to get reelected. Right. And, and I, I think offline, I, I've shared this with you, I, I recently interviewed in the last few months both um, uh, Branko Milanovic, econo mm -hmm. economist who's, who's a great yes. focus on uh, I know it's done a lot of work with him. Yeah, he's great. And Rebecca Henderson at the business mm -hmm. school at Harvard. And both of them said that when... Um, the raising of s s stockholder value becomes the primary goal of mm -hmm. corporate action, rather than in other countries and in other and in other times, it's been much broader than that. But Milton Friedman mm -hmm. suggested in 1970 that it should just be this the the stock price. When you do that, it becomes logical in pursuit of that goal to rig the rules you play by. Mm -hmm. The return for the stockholder is going to be improved if you can use your wealth and your influence to rig the rules. And that's what corporations have done. It was, of course, accelerated with Citizens United. But at that yes. point, capitalism has no chance of fulfilling an illusion of fairness. Well, the idea of capitalism is that it is embedded in a democracy that governs it to give it its moral legitimacy. And when the servant becomes the master, when you have the inversion, as I guess Sting had that song, wrapped around your finger, uh, then the moral legitimacy of the system breaks down and the side effects, the results, the despair, the, the unresponsiveness of the system becomes rampant. Um, hmm. I was going to say, so So we, what, what Nancy Fraser says is there's progressive neoliberalism, which we've kind of, mm -hmm. well, you, you pander, or not pander, you may even deliver on social and cultural aspects um, mm -hmm. to, uh, as we said, uh, people, you know, on, on gender issues, on, on uh, Latino, uh, black, women, and so on, all of that stuff but you don't deliver where it really matters. Um, and then she's, she, the rival is reactionary neoliberalism, the old fashioned mm -hmm. one that makes no bones about who, who's, you know, what, it, what its, what its uh, vision is and mm -hmm. what it's trying to do. And she says that what can deliver us from this current situation we're in, and she says she doesn't think that reactionary neoliberalism could ever bring along the folks that the Democrats are serving with their identity politics, but that if you had a transformed and revitalized progressive uh, set of policies, you might be able to bring people who were the Trump voters, the Reagan Democrats over. Can yeah. you talk just a little bit about that? Yeah, let me, let me start with something that really sticks in my craw. 400 years and slavery in the United States is the absolute contradiction of our founding principles that's most vivid. 
and repairing that, whether you call it reparations or what, is necessary to our rebalancing. But we are in an era where while that mission is essential, when I look at our prison industrial system and all that, it's a, it's a nightmare. When I look at, the and I, my friend Peter Temin has a book coming out shortly, INET series, Cambridge University Press, called Never Together, about all of the pushback to refute racial progress that's taken place since the Reconstruction after the Civil War. And it's, it's really a haunting manuscript to read. But what, I'm, what I want to bring this to is all of that is part of justice. But when everybody else's ship is sinking too, they're not going to say, you can take care of them while I drown. You've got to do something much more broad-based, which includes that necessary condition. And what I don't like on what I'll call the hard right is how they demonize people who've suffered because they're not being carried by the agenda that relates to the necessary reparation of, of 400 years of crime. As a friend of mine, former NBA basketball player Isaiah Thomas said, we shouldn't be talking about human rights, we should be talking about birth rights that all humans have, regardless of their ethnic or racial background. And my sense is that we are in this place where the, the pain and the fear is so large that we're splitting further rather than healing. And the danger that I see now with the U.S. at the center of a world system, with China growing up in terms of its prosperity and its power and its military, when I see all of these tensions related to environment and everything else, the danger of fear leading to an authoritarian alternative rather than the healing in an inclusive democratic alternative is upon us. And I think, as you and I have focused on in the earlier parts of this conversation, the role of money in politics, the role in money in who gets appointed to the courts, and whether you're dealing with Argentine sovereign debt in New York courts by judges who were appointed because hedge fund managers wanted them, or whether you're talking about anything related to voter representation, what's okay about gerrymandering or not. The struggle to disenfranchise for concentrated powerful interest benefit is terrifying. And people can see this, the struggle going on in plain sight. So I do think that the fear, and we got a taste of it from Donald Trump, the fear, when that man runs around the country and says the system is rigged, if you look at the ads, you can find them on YouTube of his last message that was played during that Cubs versus Cleveland World Series when the Cubs finally won the World Series. And the next day, which was right before Election Day, it was a Sunday and a Monday. And he is saying, and the American people are the only ones that can rise up to, to defeat this rigged system. As he's showing pictures of the Chinese with Hillary Clinton, of people like George Soros, of people like um, Goldman Sachs executives. And he is painting a picture of him being their warrior. And then, as you said... When he got acclimated to the system, he seduced and abandoned the people he inspired. Well, so I he think found that... he found a taste of the disease to surf on, but he didn't heal it. And if we don't get into the healing business now, with climate change requiring us to both heal and massively transform the economy, and what I and I want to say one last piece. When you have to do something as large as climate change, the scale of the transformation terrifies people. 
People from West Virginia say, I saw what happened to Cleveland and Detroit. Why should I join this romance when you guys are going to leave us behind and crush us? In other words, the resistance to the obvious dangers of climate come from the people who don't trust the system to create transformational energy so that we're all better off. Yeah. A couple of reflections from what you said. One was that, well, it, it all comes down to the sort, same sort of thing, really, is that I've often felt that we now, as I said in the intro, face crises that range from the really critical to the existential. Um, mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. you know, I enumerate them previously in, in, these, in these conversations. Climate change, pandemic, and future pandemics, uh, economic injustice, racial injustice, uh, and um, the nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. The bigger and the and the and the frag, fragility of democracy itself. Yes. The bigger the crisis, the more we need to come together. Yes. And yet, the crises are feeding tribalism fear, all of that sort of thing, and, and this tension between how people are responding to what they feel and what's needed to actually respond as a nation or as a global society to what we face are, are pulling, pulling apart. I, I wanted to say just one other thing that I'd realized as you were speaking, and then let's talk about what might help, what might begin to move mm -hmm. us in the right direction. And one was that as difficult as the civil rights advances of the 1960s were, and we, we know the, pic, the pictures we saw, we know the mistreatment, we know the divides in society that were taking place, the country was doing pretty well. The middle mm -hmm. class was living a good life. You felt mm -hmm. your kids were mm -hmm. gonna have a better life than you did. Your kids were going to have more education than you did. You, and so the fact that we could handle a huge problem like that in as much as we did partly rested in the fact that the need to scapegoat the African-American was less felt by less people. Let, or yes. you know what I'm saying. Well, they Both didn't see it as a zero-sum game. That's they right. They saw us on an escalator. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And those were the biggest advances we made in the 20th century, you know, mm -hmm. were because... And now, when the last 50 years have hollowed out the possibilities for those people, now you try to solve critical problems and you run into what we're talking about. Resignation, anger, tribalism, fear, etc. Yes. Yes. How... I think about this a lot, you think about this a lot. How are we going to be able to move together to solve some of this? It's, we're talking about systemic change, political, mm -hmm. economic, social and cultural, yes, but political and economic, uh, it seems to me, hand in glove, um, are working against our best fortunes rather than for them mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah, I think there are lots of dimensions to this. Uh, one, which you're a wonderful counterweight to, is what kind of information do people get about the possibilities and the dangers? If you say universities are dependent on big corporate laboratories and wealthy donors, if you say the mainstream media is dependent upon advertisers... what What is either, I mean, your kind of where you come down to as, as you go to sleep each night thinking about this stuff or as you get up in the morning thinking, where, where, where do you, in your, in your gut, in your heart, where do you think where is our path to actually solving some of this, which given the crises we've talked about is, is, um, is serious business for us, for our children and for the rest of the planet. Yep. I think that we are in a place where each individual in our republic has to start with resisting their own temptation to rage from fear. Mm 